This morning we're going to talk about uh, does God love sinners? And this is going to be two parts to this message. First of all, we're going to look at God's love. Who is God's? What is you know? What is the situation with God's love? Second, we're going to look at God's wrath and hatred. Who's that for? We'll start out with the world's favorite memory verse. If you went up to somebody and you said, uh, "Does God love people?" You know, can you prove uh, God's love for somebody? What verse would they tell you to turn to? 3.16. John 3.16. So that's where we're going to start out. Before we read the verse, though, uh, I just want to say something. And that is there's a very popular teaching today, and that is that God loves you. Somebody says, you know, God loves you. There's a house not too far from here that has a, a big thing out front. It's like a big cross deal, and it says, Smile, God loves you. Is that true? Where, well, if whenever somebody makes a statement, the the first thing that you should do is you should say, "What saith the scriptures?" You know, it talks in the book of Acts about the Bereans, the believers at Berea, how they search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. Okay, that's what you should be as a Christian. You should search the scriptures. What does the Bible say? So somebody says, "God loves you." Okay. Go home, get a concordance, or if you have a little computer program or whatever, I use a thing called Sword Searcher. Type it in, God loves you. Guess how many times that appears in the Bible? Zero. How about God loves sinners? Zero. Guess how many times the word loves appears? Three. Guess how many times it's a reference to God loving anybody? Zero. It's interesting because the three references to the word loves, L-O-V-E-S, is Psalm 45.1, Proverbs 7.18, Song of Solomon 7.12. All three times it's a reference to intimacy. I'll say it that way. Not once is it a reference to God and his feelings toward man. Not once. It's all human. Okay, that's very important to get. And so somebody comes along and they say, oh, God loves you. That's not in the Bible. And I'm going to show you today why that's actually a very, very serious false teaching. Okay, now, if somebody comes up to you and says, God loved you, they change the S to a D. Well, then that is scriptural. And I'm going to show you some of that. Okay, because loved is past tense. And we're going to get into that as we go through this study. But just remember, an easy way to remember truth versus error is God ends with a D. Loved ends with a D. Okay? So God loved the world. But when somebody said God loves, and they put an S there, they change the D to the S, well, then it's wrong. Okay, because loves is present tense. And it, an easy way to remember that that's wrong is just remember who starts with an S. Satan, the serpent. Okay? <laughs> so when somebody changes loved to loves, you know where it's coming from. But let's go to John 3.16 here. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, is that love? Absolutely. But where is that love manifest? That love is at Calvary. It's a past event, something that took place in your past. You can't say, I reject Jesus Christ. I don't want anything to do with Jesus Christ, but God still loves me. No, he doesn't. And I'm going to show you that in this study. Okay, that is a very serious heresy that is being taught. It's very prevalent in today's church that God, present tense, loves the sinners. And he doesn't. That The Bible does not teach that God, present tense, loves a sinner. He loved, with a D, he loved the sinner back in the past. Okay, and we're going to hit a lot of scripture today. So first we're going to look at the love of God. Romans 5, verse 6. We're going to go there next. We're going to go to a lot of the scriptures that somebody will try and use to prove that God, present tense, loves a Christ-rejecting sinner. And I'm telling you, he does not. Romans 5, verse 6 
says here, For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, oh, well, God loves the sinner. No, God loved the sinner. Christ died for sinners. It's past tense. But you get somebody who rejects Jesus Christ, God's love is not manifest on that person. And I'm going to show you a little bit later about that whole thing there. Okay, 1 Timothy 1.15. Now, I'll tell you what, going through this study, you know, as is typical, there are so many scriptures. It just, you know, I came across so many. There's just no way I can cover them all. I mean, I could do a 10-part message, but I, I try to avoid 10-part messages simply because I know people are busy and they don't want to sit around and hear me, you know, for 10 or 12 hours. Okay, um, First Timothy 1.15, here's another one people will use. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now, if you are a Roman Catholic, Christ Jesus comes into the world every single time the priest, the pedophile priest stands up there and does Mass. Jesus Christ is continually being sacrificed every day. He has to be sacrificed over and over and over and over again. That's Catholic doctrine. That's not Bible doctrine. Jesus Christ came in and he paid for sins once at Calvary. And when did that happen? Is it happening now? No, it happened in the past. God's love as was manifest at Calvary. And until you go to Calvary, you're not going to find God's love. Okay? Titus chapter 3. We'll go to Titus chapter 3 next. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. It says here, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Okay, you were in sin there in verse 3. But after that, after what? After salvation. When you come to the point where you realize, hey, I'm a sinner, and God's wrath is upon me. Okay, we're going to see about that in just a little bit here. That's a, the later part of the message. But when you realize, I'm a sinner, I'm on my way to hell. You don't realize, hey, I'm a sinner, and God loves me in my sin. That doesn't make sense. What's the purpose of, of getting saved if God loves you as a sinner? That's ridiculous. What would be the point? You realize, I'm a sinner, I'm going to hell. I need to get saved. And then, at that point, you go to the cross, and there is where God's love comes. God's love is not on you when you reject that. Okay? That is heresy. It is satanic heresy, as a matter of fact. Now we're going to go to the big one. This is the one that's probably going to be used the most. 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. This talks probably more about love, God's love, than any other chapter in the New Testament. So we're going to hit 1 John chapter 4 here, beginning in verse 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are going out into the world. And that's never been truer than today. It's so frustrating when you witness to somebody, when you're writing to somebody, I have a lot of contact with people on the internet, and they say, well, I'm, I'm going to look up this article or that article. I want to find out more about this. It's just like, oh, man. <laughs> the chance of them finding a good Bible-believing website is very rare. There are so many heretical websites out there, it's just incredible. So many false prophets. Okay, And you're not to believe every spirit. You're to try them. Okay, verse 2. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh 
is of God. If you have an NIV, by the way, it says has come in the flesh. The NIV is an antichrist spirit. Verse 3, And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God, and this is that spirit of antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. The spirit of Antichrist, the Antichrist isn't just going to show up one day and everybody's going to go, oh, he's here now, let's worship him. No, the Antichrist, that spirit is already building and you can see it, right? I mean, especially now in America, I mean, the spirit of Antichrist is growing and growing and growing. People are becoming hardened to the gospel. What you could do ten, even 10 years ago, you would have better response from people preaching the gospel to them. Today, they don't want to hear it. Okay, the doors are shutting here in America for ministry. All right, people are becoming hardened. Why? The spirit of Antichrist is growing. Okay, the more new versions come out, the more wicked, abominable movies and television shows come out, the more the spirit of Antichrist is building. Okay, what, you know, it used to be witchcraft was kind of a dirty thing and people, you know, there's no way the public would have accepted it back 50 years ago, 60 years ago, we'll say. Today, it's mainstream. It's cool to be a witch. It's cool to be a vampire. And today's Halloween, you know? Their parents aren't saying, hey, I don't want you dressing up like that. No, they're saying, hey, dress up whatever you want. Whatever the Bible calls an abomination, dress up like that. You know, the spirit of Antichrist is building. I could go off on that for a long time. But let's continue here. Verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. You shouldn't be popular as a Christian. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, just look at that verse right there. Does God love the spirit of error? Well, if you believe this modern false gospel of God-loving sinners, well, then you would probably have to say yes. God loves truth. God loves error. God loves everything. Uh, no, that doesn't work. Let's continue. Verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God, dealing with believers. Verse 8, He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us. Does that mean lost people? No. Saved people. He's writing to saved people. That's the us there. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now see, it goes back, it switches back to the love that was manifest at Calvary. You see the D appearing there again? <coughs> loved. God loved us. Okay. Uh, verse 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Again, talking about saved people. Verse 13. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. God's love is for those who repent and get saved. Okay, verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Speaking about saved people. Verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. See the D again? Loved. When did God first love the world? At Calvary. Okay? If you are alive today, you need to get God's love at Calvary. 
You don't get God's love by rejecting Calvary. Okay, that is heresy. Verse 20. Uh, if, a, if a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Again, speaking about saved people. Your brother is not the lost man down the street that rejects Jesus Christ and gets mad at you when you try to witness. That's not your brother. Okay, I'm not saying that you should hate them. You shouldn't hate your enemies like that. You're to love your enemies, the Bible says, and you love them by preaching the truth to them. You don't love them by telling them, hey, God loves you. You know, I remember the one time we were going fishing, me and my brother-in-law, and there was a motorcycle up in, in front of us, a Harley Davidson, which there's some technology issues there. Usually a motorcycle, without going off on too big of a tangent, usually a motorcycle, if the kickstand is down, it usually shuts the bike off. There's a little switch that you have there. Most good motorcycles have them. But the Harley-Davidson there, it did not have this. And the guy was driving down the road, normal speed, with his kickstand down. Now, you go into a corner, a left-hand corner, that kickstand's going to grab the pavement, and you're going to, you know, be grabbing some pavement yourself. Now, we tried to stop the guy. We tried to pull him over, and, and he just wasn't paying attention or whatever, and he took off. We couldn't catch him. But how would it have been love for us to just say, oh, well, forget it. Don't flash the lights. Don't blow the horn. It's okay. We see he's got a problem. We see he's going to crash, but I, I just want to, I don't want to ruin his day. I don't want to stress him out. See, that's not love. And when you see somebody in sin and you tell them, God loves you. They're headed for destruction. They're going to crash. But you say, hey, God loves you. Don't worry about it. God loves you. You are not warning them. They are headed for God's wrath, for God's judgment. And you're not warning them. Okay? God loved you at Calvary. That's fine. But to just say God loves you, present tense, that's wrong. That's not right. Okay? Go to chapter 5 here. We'll read the first two verses and then we'll continue on. 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat, that's God, loveth him also that is begotten of him, Jesus Christ. Verse 2. By this ye know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Okay? When you... Love God and you keep his commandments, then God's love is manifest on you. Okay? And you will see verses of scripture. We're going to be hitting these here, uh, coming up right now, actually. We're going to go to a couple. And that is, the Bible does teach that God loves a certain group of sinners. And those sinners are saved sinners. <laughs> you and me. God does love, present tense, a saved sinner. But he doesn't love a lost sinner. Okay, he loved them at Calvary. And that's where they need to go. Okay, turn back to Romans chapter 8. We'll hit a couple of these quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 35. And these verses that I'm going to be talking about here and reading, these next, we're going to look at three different passages. These wicked modern preachers will use these scriptures. They will preach these to lost people to get them to think that God loves them. And in context, it's written to saved, born-again Christians. But you read this stuff to the lost and they go, Oh, see, God loves us. This does not apply to the lost. You are stealing God's promises for Christians, for saved sinners. You are stealing them and applying them to the lost. When you read these passages for lost people, it says here, Romans chapter 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Usually they skip that verse. Verse 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor angels, 
nor principalities, nor powers. I'm sorry, I skipped nor life. Nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now look there at verse 39. The love, present tense. That's present tense. The love of God. And what's it in? Christ Jesus our Lord. Are the lost in Christ Jesus our Lord? No. No. So then God's love, present tense, does not manifest on them. These scriptures right here deal with those that are part of the body of Christ. They do not pertain to the lost world that rejects Jesus. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verse 9. says here, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. That's not written to the lost. That's written to save people. Okay? God's love is not manifest on the lost. Second Corinthians chapter 13. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. So we're going to go next. You're going to see this again as a promise for saved people. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind. Can you be of one mind with the lost? No. No. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. That's present tense. Uh, verse 12. Greet one another with an holy kiss. All the saints salute you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. That's for saved people. Okay? Say, oh, God loves sinners. Well, if they're saved sinners, yes. If they're lost, no. He doesn't. He loved the lost world and gave his only begotten son. Okay. And speaking of that, head on back to John chapter 3. A lot of people know about John 3.16, but they don't keep reading. And you need to keep reading there. You need to, what do they say, a, a text without a context is a pretext. John chapter 3 verse 16 Okay, it says here, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now look at verse 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Okay, the cross there, a lot of people say, Oh, that's, you know, that's against me. And stuff. Well, it's against your self-righteousness. Okay, but that's where salvation comes. That's where God's love is manifest. Okay. The world, through Jesus Christ, can be saved by the cross. Verse 18, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Is that love? No. How can you read that and say that God's love is on a lost person? He condemns them with love? I mean, give me a break. It says here, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, and, and I'll read verse 19 and 20 yet. And this is the condemnation that light is coming into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Okay, good description of the lost. Now, we're not going to go to all these places because it's... For sake of time, it would just take a long time. I'm just going to give you the scriptures here. I'm going to read some of it, uh, but we'll continue on here in a minute. What about the wrath of God? Okay, we're going to go to part two of the message now. The wrath of God, who is it manifest on? Romans 1, 18 through 19 says, For the wrath of God is revealed un from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, 
for God hath showed it unto them. And read the rest of Romans chapter 1 sometime. Okay, read all of Romans chapter 1 and show me how that God loves the sinners there. He doesn't. Okay, read through that thing sometime. Romans chapter 2 verse 5 through 9 says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life. Verse 8, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath. How can you get love out of that? Verse 9, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. How can you possibly fit love into that? It's not there. Okay, you reject Jesus Christ. God's wrath is on you. Ephesians 5, verse 5. For this ye know that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. You see, I don't believe God's wrath is manifest on a child that's never heard, that really can't understand the gospel. But when that child gets to be older, and they get to be a man or a woman, or a young man or young woman, and they hear about Jesus Christ, and they reject Jesus Christ, they are now a child of disobedience. Okay, you can't disobey something until you've heard the thing. Okay? And when you hear the gospel for the first time, right then it is the decision made. Okay? You are presented with God's love that was manifest at Calvary. God commended his love toward us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There it is. What are you going to do with it? I don't want to hear about it. You are now a child of disobedience. Okay? It's not an option. It's not, hey, you know, would you like to try this? You know, try it out for a little bit, you know, 90 day trial? No. You are commanded. You are on your way to hell. You are a sinner. You need to repent. You need to get saved. I don't want anything to do with it, okay? You're a child of disobedience. And at that point, God's judgment and his wrath is upon you. God does not love you at that point. The love is there at Calvary. That's where you're going to find it. You're not going to find it in your day-to-day -day walk. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 says, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Okay, you see it again there. Now there's a lot more here I have typed out, but we're not going to go through it for sake of time. But Revelation 14.10, Revelation 14.19, Revelation 15.1, 15.7, 16.1, and chapter 19, verse 15. Read through the, just read through the whole book of Revelation sometime and Look at how God pours out his love on the lost world. <laughs> you know, I mean, give me a break. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven. The wrath of God turns the water and the oceans into blood, smites men with a curse. You know, just how can you get love out of that? I don't understand that. God's wrath is manifest on, is going to be poured out on this lost world very soon. Soon. Okay, Romans chapter 9. Uh, another thing that's very popular here, we're going to hit a couple more, and then we're going to be finished. Romans chapter 9, verse 13. People say, well, God never hated anybody. You know, I don't believe that God ever hated anybody. You know, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin, blah, blah, blah. Which also, by the way, that doesn't appear in the Bible. God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. That's not in the Scripture. Okay, it's another uh, man-made tradition. But people say, well, God never hated anybody. Oh, really? Romans chapter 9, verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. It doesn't say Esau's sin have I hated. It says Esau have I hated. And we're going to see why God hated Esau. But it says there, notice, it says, by the way, it's interesting there, the numbers 9 and 13. Uh, God definitely has a, a system of numbers 
uh, spelled out in the Bible. Look up Proverbs 13, 13 sometimes. Very interesting. But it says there, as it is written. Now, whenever you see that in your New Testament, that's Paul or whoever's writing. They're quoting something from the Old Testament. So where is this written? Turn back to the last book in your Old Testament, Malachi. The book of Malachi, chapter 1. Go to Matthew in your New Testament and then turn a couple pages towards the front and you'll have Malachi chapter 1, verses 2 through 3. Okay, well, we'll start at verse 1. We might as well. It's not that long. It says here, The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, Wherein hast thou loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, verse 3, and I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Now there's some very, very interesting things in there. Okay, and you're going to see here Esau, what he is in type. And look what the Lord says he does to him. He laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Hmm. You say, do you, oh, you don't believe in dragons, do you? Sure I do. Absolutely. Okay. I do believe in them. Which is another study. We won't get into that right now. But notice there in verse 2 it says, loved us. Okay. I loved Jacob. Okay. Again, you got to watch out for this loves thing. Now, what was Esau's problem? Why did God hate Esau? Go back to the very first book in your Bible, Genesis, the book of Genesis chapter 25. We're going to see why God hated Esau. Genesis chapter 25, verse 24. We're going to see about the birth and, and what... What all went on here? Okay, Genesis 25, verse 24. And when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red all over like an hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. Okay, threescore years. A score is 20, so he was 60 years old. Verse 27, And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Verse 29, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therewith, or therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, sell, sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he sware unto him, and sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, I can guarantee you that he was not at the point of death. <laughs> Just as modern day Americans, they say, oh, I'm starving to death. Why? Well, I haven't eaten in four hours. You know, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Okay, if you could walk, you know, back there to your home and things, he wasn't at the point of death. Okay, he was walking. He wasn't crawling on the ground. But you see, he was fleshly. And he was so hungry, and, and his brother said, well, how about giving me your birthright? Oh, yeah, sure, yeah, whatever. That doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah, sure, d you know, give me something to eat. And, you know, there's a lot of Americans that are doing the same thing right now. A lot of modern-day Christians are selling the birthright. You say, what is the birthright of an American Christian? King James Bible. So, oh, now, come on, King James onlyism. Hear me out on this. Many people do not understand what the significance of the King James Bible is. They have forgotten about the persecution of the Catholic Church. They have forgotten about the martyrs whose blood was shed 
and how people were burned at the stake. And many of the early Bibles, like the Tyndale Bible, were actually used to start the fires that burned the early Christians. And the, your King James Bible is 95% Tyndale's work. Okay? This Bible that you hold in your hands, if you're a King James Bible believer, this thing is the, is the product of millions of Christians suffering and dying. America, the only reason that you're here and that you're not in jail being tortured right now is because of this heritage. The King James Bible believing Christians that came here. And, you know, oh, America was a Christian nation. All of our leaders were Christian. No, I don't think so. But there was a very strong majority of Bible believing Christians that came here and they forced the Congress and, and the early government to allow them to worship here freely. And you, but you read some of the stories, they were being beaten here in America, a lot of those early Christians. Okay, we have always had to struggle. That's your birthright if you're here in America. And if you're in the UK and a lot of the other places where this King James Bible also brought you freedom. This is your birthright. And yet how many modern Christians sell it out? A lot of them. They sell it out and they return to the Roman Catholic Church and get an NIV or a New American Standard or whatever. Those Bibles, you do the research, they go back to the Roman Catholic Church. The Nestle's text is from the Vatican. And I, you know, I get so upset about this and people, oh, you know, it's, it's just not a big deal. Give me the mess of pottage. Here's the birthright. I don't care. They sell out and they'll sell out the old hymns that many of, many times are written from scripture. There are old hymns in, the, in our hymn book that actually are word for word from the King James Bible. And the modern Christians, they sell this out. And they will return to, you know, rock and roll type of music and things like that. They'll go right back to paganism. They are selling their birthright to please their flesh. And that's what Esau did. And that was one of the reasons why God hated him. Not hated his sin. Why God hated him. That's what the Bible says. But let's look at his other sin that he had here. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. Another thing that you can do to, to get God's hatred upon you. Uh, Genesis chapter 26, verse 34. And Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri, the Hittite, and Bashemeth, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite. Now, study that thing out sometime. We're not going to go through all the scriptures, but a Hittite is a descendant of Ham. Okay, the Canaanites. He was an African. And they were told, you are to get a wife. You, the, the Israelites were to, you know, the early uh, Shemitic people here were, were supposed to marry within their own kindred. Okay, I don't mean brothers and sisters. I mean their own people among the Jews. But what, is, what does Esau do? He goes out and he marries two, not one, but two Hamites. And look what... Uh, his mother's reaction is. Verse 35, which were a grief of mind unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Okay? And uh, I don't have the verse here listed, but she actually says that, uh, you know, she despairs of life and things like that. Um, so he dishonored his parents. Now, we just went over this in our, our Bible study last week. Ephesians chapter 6 verses 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. You want a long life? Honor your parents. Okay? Doesn't mean you have to agree with everything that they say or do, but you're to honor them. Okay? So what did Esau do? First of all, he sold his birthright. Secondly, he dishonored his parents. It was a grief to them. They were ashamed of him. Okay, Bible talks about a foolish son brings his mother to, to shame, you know, back there in the book of Proverbs. Yeah. And because of those things, God actually physically hated the man. He, he did not, well, you know, I don't agree with what he's, no. He hated Esau. That's what the Bible says. Okay, now we're going to go to Psalm chapter 7. Hit a couple more places here quick and then we're done. Psalm chapter 7. 
this one's an easy one to remember if you're if you want a verse to show people that God does not love sinners. Psalm seven eleven. Psalm seven eleven through thirteen. Okay, it says God judgeth the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. If he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Is that love? No. It says, God judgeth the righteous, and he does, and God is angry with the wicked every day. That's not love. That's anger. It's God's wrath. Verse 12, if he turn not. You know what turn not means? That means repent. That means to turn from your sin, to turn from the way you used to be. You are to repent. The Bible teaches salvation is repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. That's salvation, biblical salvation. But if you don't turn, if you don't repent, God there, he will wet his sword he wet his sword as in a, in, a, in a wet stone. He will sharpen the edge of his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. How I mean, how's that for a picture of God's love? You get some lost person down here on the earth. Ah, don't tell me about that Jesus. I don't want to hear about that stuff. Get out of here, you old preacher. You know, blah, blah, blah. And up in heaven, God has a bow and he puts an arrow in it and he pulls it. Wouldn't that be a picture? Guy looks up towards heaven and he sees this big broad head up there and God at the other end of it going, you better repent, you better repent. I'm going to shoot you. I'm going to take you down, kill you, and send you into hell. <laughs> That's the picture of God. God's love is manifest at Calvary. It's not manifest when you reject Jesus Christ. Okay, I get so sick and tired of that. Uh, there's a whole thing right now I just saw on the internet and it's so vexing I, I hate to even mention it. There's a, a group of modern day Christians that are passing out Bibles at pornography events and it's a pink and yellow Bible that says God loves porn stars. See? What is that? That's Satanism. Those people, they should be outside. You should never go into a place like that. Okay? You should be outside preaching on the street and saying, this is wickedness, this is evil, God's wrath is upon this. You don't go in and say, hey, God loves you and what you're doing. And they showed a porn star in one of the things there, and she said, she's standing there holding one, and she goes, Jesus loves porn. That's what she said. See? And these modern-day professing Christians, that's all they are, they're professing. Those guys aren't saved. They're going in there, and they're giving these people a false sense of God's love being upon them when it isn't. God's love is not upon wicked fornicators like that and whoremongers. His love is not manifest on somebody like that. I mean, why? There in Matthew 7, I believe it is, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why would he say that to somebody he loves? He doesn't. His anger is upon them every day. Okay? Two more places. Well, actually, one more place and then we're done. Second Thessalonians. Here's another good one for you modern love people. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10 through 12. I just while you're turning there, I, I just want to say here too, uh, James Melton has a good little tract you can get. Uh, not sure what it's I think it's uh I can't remember his uh, Bible Believers Publishing or something. I should have his website. I don't. It's not here on the track, but you can get this. Just go to you know look up James Melton online, and there's a little track here. It says "Smile, God loves you." The biggest lie ever told, <laughs> and it's a good track. Okay, you can get that and hand it out to your modern professing Christian friends. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse ten, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the truth. And you have to love him to have God's love manifest on you. Okay, But these people receive not the love of the truth. Now look at what God does to them. Verse 11. And for this cause 
God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. God sending damnation, sending delusion so that these people will go to hell and burn forever? Yeah, absolutely. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a righteous God. Okay? God does not love sinners. And you do violence to them when you do not warn them. When you do not judge their sin and say, Hey, you know what? That thing that you're doing there, God's angry with you. You're going to die. You're going to go to hell. But that's not popular today. You tell people, oh, God loves you. God loves you. Don't turn from your sin. You're not wicked. God's not angry with you. He's not up there ready to kill you and send you to hell. Oh no, God loves you. Don't fall for that. That is a satanic heresy. Okay? And you say, well, I don't agree with that. I, I think that God loves sinners. Okay, send me the verses. Send me the scriptures from the King James Bible. Don't send me some wicked modern perversion that you know some Catholic Jesuit wrote or something. Send me the King James Bible. Send me King James Bible scriptures that say God loves a sinner, present tense. Show me one. There aren't any. Okay? God loved the lost. That He gave His only begotten Son in the past. Okay? That's it for this morning. Um, remember, the Bible does not teach that God loves S. He loved and get that thing out of your vocabulary. If you're telling people that God loves them, you're lying to them. And you will be judged for that. God loved them and gave His only begotten Son. So that's it for this morning. Thank you for listening. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.